Clouds of dirt trailed behind the 2001 Toyota Tacoma. Anxious, excited air filled the cab of the beat-up truck. After the year that my wife and I have had, we'd been anticipating getting a fresh start. Like a game of Tetris, I had managed to pack all of our belongings into the bed of our truck. Of course, we were severely lacking furniture, due to living in a cramped Chicago apartment prior to now. I majored in creative writing at DePaul University. I was longing to get out of the city and live in a rural town, like the one I had grown up in. I was hoping that the change of scenery would inspire me as it does most driving riders. My wife Hannah is a customer service representative, and she conducts her business over the phone and through the internet. We both wanted a change of pace, and we decided that moving would be an interesting idea. It took months of searching, but alas, we had found the perfect place. My wife and I loaded up the truck and hopped onto Lake Street. We headed west, leaving early enough to escape the morning traffic. Most people who don't live in Chicago or even Illinois don't understand that we have vast farmlands and wildlife mere miles from the hustle and bustle of the city. Our new home was a one-story ranch near the Edwards River in Mercer County, Illinois. Main roads could only take us so far. We soon found ourselves on unpaved, untreated, raw dirt roads. Trees and wildlife littered the path as we trekked to find our new home. Hannah was napping in the passenger seat when she had been woken up by the blunt end of the paved road. She looked confused when she awoke, clearly unfamiliar with her surroundings. She soon sunk back into her seat and a smile crept onto her face. Wow, what a pretty path, she almost whispered, her voice almost entirely masked by the low volume of the radio. It's a good thing. I mean, we never have to worry about the neighbors throwing parties and keeping us up all night, I replied. She giggled at me and smiled. She took my hand in hers and then continued to look out the window. The path soon snaked around a small pond and we found ourselves in the middle of a glade. The clearing was bordered by woods with the house located in the center. The practically impenetrable forest made the house look tiny in comparison. The dirt path we had been driving on had led to the side of the house and around the back. Instead of seeing the path to its end, I parked 20 feet from the front entrance. The house looked like a projection of my car. Old, run down, but gets the job done nevertheless. The front door was directly in the center of the house, with windows spaced evenly on both sides. Old brown siding, topped with a dilapidated black shingled roof, gave the home a slightly ominous look. I unlocked the doors as we unlaced our fingers and got out of the truck. I walked around to Hannah's side, and we both stood there silently observing the place. This is where we were going to be spending the rest of our days. Well, it's not the prettiest thing I've seen, but it's got character, you know. We could always go into town, buy some new paint, and touch up the outside. And once we save up enough money, we could have someone reaching the roof. I, for one, can't wait to start planting my garden, she added, breaking the thick silence. I took it all in for another moment, imagining what Hannah had said. The garden out back, the potential of children running around the yard, maybe even throwing a ball with our future family dog. A smile formed proudly on my face. It's perfect, I finally said. Hannah turned to me, mirroring my glee. We unpacked and moved our belongings into the house. The home was small. Only three bedrooms and one bathroom all along the back wall. Through the entrance of the house, there was a giant main room. It consisted of a kitchen, a living room, and a dining room, all assigned to that open area. We turned the extra rooms into offices for work, one for me and one for Hannah. Although, we wouldn't be able to use these offices until the following Wednesday. That's when the Comcast people were supposed to venture out to our estate and set up the internet and landline. That meant Hannah and I were taking a much-needed hiatus from our jobs. We decided to take a trip into town and try to get an understanding of the surroundings that we now lived in. So we headed back down the dirt path and deserted road and found ourselves in a small town that had a main street with small shops all along it. We continued to take the main street for some time and tried to identify restaurants that we would potentially eat at. Dell's Diner was one of the first establishments that we came across. After not eating for the entirety of the drive, Hannah and I were famished. We walked into this small, very cozy diner where we were greeted by a middle-aged woman. She had wrinkles around her hard, dark eyes, and she wore a red polo, khakis, and a pink and red striped apron to top it off. The name tag pinned on her upper left chest read Bianca. Just two? 
Uh, yes, ma'am, I responded. Follow me, she said indifferently. Bianca grabbed two menus and slowly made her way down the path with the booths and tables lining the edges. Suddenly, she stopped and turned towards us. She stuck her arm out and pointed to the booth to her right. She placed the menus on the table. Hannah took the initiative and scooted into the side furthest away from the tired-looking waitress. I slid into the seat next to Hannah. We settled into our seats and turned our focus back to Bianca. She reached her hand into the pocket of her apron and pulled out a pad of paper and a pen. Are you two just driving through? She asked. No, we're actually moving in. We bought the house on the outskirts of the town near Edwards River, Hannah responded. Bianca turned her attention to my wife, surprise obvious on her face. She looked puzzled, as if she was trying to decide whether or not to inform us of something. Hannah and I shared questioning glances with each other, the entire diner filled with an awkward silence. It felt like this verbal agreement to remain in silence lasted a lifetime, when it was probably just 30 seconds. So, you are the folk that bought Jorge Peterson's house. What should have been a dry emotionless statement was filled with emotion. She said this as though she was pitying us. My wife picked up on it just as soon as I did, and a pit started to form in the bottom of my stomach. Is that not a good thing? Hannah challenged. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. You two aren't from my neck of the woods, the waitress said while she put the pad of paper and pen on the table. Well, Mr. Peterson was a very nice guy. He'd come to this diner after his hunting trips and would always get the same old thing. She said this almost reminiscing trying hard to picture the man, a scene she had become accustomed to. Well, one day his brother decided to surprise him and his sister-in-law, but when he arrived at the house, it was abandoned. The brother called the cops after he found blood in the house. He started searching for them and ended up in another glade. This one was littered with blood. The town folk had tried to organize a search party, but it never amounted to anything. The sheriffs had investigated the matters for a while. They tested the blood and it was Mrs. Peterson and their 10-year-old daughter. There was a lot of blood, too much blood. She looked at the table, pausing her story, haunted by the image. You could almost see the sadness reverberate out of her eyes. Hannah and I were completely engrossed in this haunting story. All of these events were unknown to me when I was in the process of purchasing the house, although it did help to explain why the house was dirt cheap. The Peterson girls were never found, and the police are still hunting for Jorge. It's just crazy to think that in this small town, where I've lived my whole life, something this terrifying could ever happen. It messed me up for a while. Our daughters used to play together. Explaining this to my daughter was one of the hardest things I've ever done. She trailed off her anecdote, and continued to stare blankly into the distance. She exhaled loudly and lightly shook her head, trying to erase the image as if her imagination was an etching sketch. Breaking the thick atmosphere, she returned to her duties. So, what can I get for you two today? We ordered and ate a relatively subpar meal and left. The whole diner was shrouded in an uncomfortable silence and in company of long pitiful glances from the waitress. The 20 minute car ride home was also plagued with the same uncomfortable muteness. Arriving back at the house, the once ominous look had now been morphed into something straight out of a horror movie. The surrounding woods had been swallowed by darkness, with the clearing only lit by the dull moonlight. The outside air was undisturbed, not a creature to be heard, only the faint sound of leaves rustling around us. We headed into the ranch and found our half-assed bedroom set up. I changed into pajamas as Hannah took a shower. I heard the rusted shower handle squeak, followed by the quiet roar of crashing water into the tub. I flopped onto the bed and immediately felt myself slipping into a deep sleep when I heard the sound of twigs snapping. My eyes lurched open and darted towards the window. The scene was painted in dim, harsh colors. Not being able to identify the sound, I decamped from the bed and tiptoed to the window. Yet, there was nothing. Not a single source that could have made the sound that was to be found. I noticed the tightening of my chest, and the slight condensation that was starting to form on the back of my neck and forehead. That damn waitress got to me, I chuckled under my breath. I returned to bed and retired for the night. In the morning, we continued to make the house feel more like someone actually lived there. Trips were made back and forth from town to get furniture and to get groceries. 
Something about that eerie story that Bianca had told us really resonated with me. It kept stirring and fermenting in my mind. I craved more information of the travesties that had been committed on my property. I had taken the truck back into town on a relaxed Wednesday morning. In search for answers, I later found myself at the library. I went to the public computers that were placed in the back of the building, and I began my search. At first, there was very little that I could find, until I stumbled across a particular article. The article provided me with the information that I was seeking. It read, Jorge Peterson and his wife Deborah had been living in that ranch with their daughter Noelle. The ranch had been in the family long before Jorge had been born, and it was gifted to him after his grandmother had passed away. They had lived there for a short five years before the incident that incited my search. According to the article, not only was the family missing, but they had been missing for a long time. In the article, it had been stated that the two girls may have been dead for up to a month due to how aged the bloodstains were. A cold chill spread throughout my body when I read the next passage. There had been forensic evidence showing that the stains were of different consistencies and volume. This meant that there is a possibility that they were not killed at once. There could have been several times where he attempted murder or the girl sustained torture. Thoughts of this man making his way back to my house made me stand up and push my chair back in too fast, making it crash to the ground in a giant heap. I looked around the tiny library. Luckily, I was the only one in the direct area. I got a grip on my panic and made my way out of the building and began to quicken my speed home. I left Hannah home alone, and who knows what could be out there, or even worse, who could be out there. My truck groaned at me as I took it down the dirt road too fast. Rocks clinked on the mostly exposed, rusted underbelly of my Tacoma. Once the house came into my sight, I could see that the front door was open. My stomach tightened. I swung the truck door open and did a light jog to the doorway. I was out of sight from anyone that could be inside. I quietly shuffled my feet to the door so that I could peek into the somber house. Thoughts of the twig snapping last night flashed through my brain, making me regret ever rationalizing the sound. I peered inside my home and saw nothing. I could feel the panic rising like a lump in my throat. My eyes started to tear up. I blurted out Hannah's name on accident, but then continued to shout it. I stood still trying to focus on any sign of her or anything that could lead me to her. I started to walk around the house and as soon as I completely rounded the corner there was a loud scream and Hannah ran into my arms from about seven feet away. My legs buckled and I fell to the ground. My stomach completely dropped and tears formed in my eyes. She started laughing hysterically, not knowing how bad she had just frightened me. Normally, I wouldn't have even flinched in her attempts of terrorizing me, but she truly got me this time. What she didn't know is how true the danger could have been. Three days went by without a bother. We had arrived in the rural area on a Tuesday, and it was now Sunday night, our couple date night. Hannah and I made a trip down into town to go out for a meal and just enjoy each other's company. During this dinner date, Hannah began to indulge in couple alcoholic beverages, and when the date was over, I drove us both home. We arrived to our house at about 1 a.m. Hannah collapsed into bed and was out like a light. She had been so tired that she still had her heels on, and being the good husband that I was, I had taken her shoes off and put a blanket over her. Feeling accomplished, I went to take a shower, but something just felt off. When I had walked through the front door, I could just tell that something was different. The air felt daunting. It was that uneasy feeling that makes you run up the stairs when you're home alone as if somebody was chasing behind you. I changed my mind about the shower and just undressed to my boxers and got into bed. I began drifting to sleep next to my inebriated wife, but I could hear the noises coming from around the ranch. I played them off and tried my best to explain them and give a name to each of the sounds. After being here for almost a week, there hadn't been much activity at night, besides the one or two twigs that would break. And that's when I heard it. There was this low screeching, like a fork being dragged across a plate. I immediately jumped out of bed and grabbed a baseball bat that I kept in the room. I sprinted out of our bedroom and ran into the front area. 
I had tried to stay quiet and listened intently to the sound so that I could dial in on the location it was coming from. I began to creep stealthily to the side of the house that the deranged noise was coming from. I tried my best to navigate through the space even though the house was almost completely pitch black. Outside it was more illuminated, being almost two days from the full moon. I inched to the window where the sound was coming from and positioned myself to the side of it. I peered out the window and saw nothing at first, until my eyes started to adjust to the darkness. I could see that there was not a living thing from the house to the woods, but as my eyes became more accustomed, I could see that the darkness was producing shapes at the edge of the clearing. I began to make out five human figures. No, seven figures. They appeared to be dressed uniformly, and it looked as if they were in robes. They stood there unmoving, in increments of what looked to be twenty feet. I stood there, not knowing how to handle the situation. Then I heard movement outside the window I was standing at, and I saw a figure rush off to join the rest of them. I sat there distracted, trying to see what this person was doing, but then I could hear rattling. It was the doorknob. I could hear somebody trying to turn the knob as quietly as they could, but I was from the city. I didn't go to bed unless the door was locked. After their attempt to gain entrance, I had just realized one of my worst fears had come true. Someone was out there, in the woods and they were after us. I briefly thought about the money I had invested in the property and all the equity that we might lose if we had to leave, along with the amount of pain that it would be to move into our parents until we could find our own place again. I was snapped back into my fear when I thought of Hannah completely passed out in our bed and not in any condition to defend herself. I rushed back into our bedroom and there I saw her sleeping peacefully. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Every rustle of the wind caused me to shoot out of bed with my bat in my hands. One time during the night, I could even hear that screeching again, but I didn't leave my wife's side. Then there was more movement. I turned my head to look out the window. My heart leaped as I saw a man staring back at me. The man seemed to be in his 40s. He had minor wrinkles that had formed around his mouth and deep bags that were under his eyes. Although his eyes were cloaked in the shadow of his hood, I could feel his hate burning a hole in me. I sat there, unmoving, as he turned and sauntered back into the forest. The all-encompassing dread had overwhelmed me, and I was unable to move even if I had tried. The human figures were still out there in the woods. Now I was truly frightened, due to the fact that they knew which room we slept in. There was no one for us to call, and we had no internet and no landline until Comcast came on the Wednesday. Relief flooded over me once I saw the darkness of the woods recede and become replaced by daylight. The once beautiful sky, filled with elaborate colors, was peaceful, but now it was just a reminder that we were on our own. Even though the daylight had overcome the horrifying night, I remained unmoved to my bed. My hands still clutched the bat and my eyes focused on the ceiling. What have I done? I thought to myself. Instead of staying in the city with our friends, I thought it would be a great idea to move somewhere more kid-friendly and look at where we were now. Self-loathing and anger flooded me, but was soon disbanded by the sound of Hannah stirring in her sleep. She looked so peaceful, ignorant to the events that had just taken place that night. She rolled onto her side so that she was facing me. My eyes landed onto her pretty face. Her blonde hair was disorganized and spread wildly onto the pillow beneath her head. The blanket only went up to her waist, exposing her dress from last night. I contemplated not confiding the terror of last night, but finally came to the conclusion that she needed to know. I don't even know how long I sat there staring at her relaxed, peaceful face. Her eyes started to twitch and eventually fluttered open. Her big brown eyes met mine and she gave me a slight smile. Good morning, she cooed. My face remained cold and unmoving and she read my expression. Oh, what's wrong? Her eyes left my face and fixed onto the bat in my hands. Confusion spread across her face. We have a lot to talk about, I paused. Get dressed, I'll meet you in the kitchen. I got up and headed out of the bedroom. I closed the door behind me and made my way to the front door. 
I disengaged the lock and swung the old oak door open. The wildlife looked unfazed, as if it was without memory. The horrors of last night had not affected the forest as it did me. The birds and insects did not break from their cries and chirps. I scanned the trees, eventually finding my truck. The tires had been slashed. Dread immediately overwhelmed me and my mouth ran dry as pure terror coursed through my veins. I stepped back into the safety of my home and turned to see my wife exiting the bedroom. I motioned her to sit at the dining room table and she complied. I then started to recite the events from last night, including the news about the tires. The severity of the situation dawned on both of us and we started to cry. We didn't just cry because we were afraid. We cried for the children we might never have and the family we might never see again. Despair floated into the atmosphere as our cries turned into whimpers. Hannah's brown eyes, now puffy and red, were anchored to the table. I watched her as she sniffled and wiped her tear-stricken cheeks. So, what are we going to do, she pleaded. I don't know, maybe we could take the truck to town or at least see how far we can get. We would be lucky to get even two miles, but I don't even think it would go that long. I could try to put a spare tire on one of the front wheels, but that should be our last case scenario. When the words left my mouth, I realized how defeated we really were. Without a clue of who these strangers really were, or a notion of what they planned to do, we were at the mercy of their sinister delights. We spent all day preparing for our unwelcomed nighttime visitors. I placed the spare tire on one of the front wheels and parked the truck a few feet from the door. The little furniture we did have, we pushed against the windows and doors to the offices and bedroom. We left the front door unbarricaded, due to it being our only quick escape option. We sat in our bedroom with the largest piece of furniture. It was a wardrobe given to Hannah by her grandmother, and now it masked our bedroom window. With every hour of daylight shining, my eyes grew heavier. Sleep pursued me, but I fought with all my will to keep it from engulfing me. I wasn't strong enough. I awoke to Hannah shaking me. Her big brown eyes oozed with fear. The cool darkness of evening blanketed our ranch. It was night. Panic leaped in my throat and I kicked myself for falling asleep. Then I heard that familiar scratching sound. The strangers were running what had to be knives along our windows. It made a sound that would drive your hairs to stand on end. My wife and I sat in the middle of the floor, holding dearly to each other. That dreadful scratching persisted for what seemed like hours, until it had suddenly come to an end. Hannah gave me a worried glance. What do you think they're going to do? She asked, almost to herself. I remained quiet, listening intently to our uninvited guests. Just as sudden as the scratching stopped, chanting took its place. The chanting started low and rhythmic, but progressed to a horrifying screech. The satanic shriek grew louder and louder, building in intensity with every heartbeat. The gibberish they were once chanting was now gone, and was replaced with guttural screams. The howl from outside appeared to be coming from all directions. Every window in the house began to be pounded on. A metallic warm taste filled my mouth, and I realized I was biting down on my lips so hard that it started to bleed. The pounding progressed to the visitors punching the windows, yet the integrity held true. Not a window had been shattered at this point, at least none that we knew of. The chaotic wells from outside gradually morphed back into a rhythmic chanting. The volume of the howl fizzled off into a low roar. The abuse on the window deliberately subsided as well. As the relentless damage of the ranch waned, the once lawless, turbulent air became peaceful once more. My wife sobbed softly into my arms. Right when I allowed myself to think that it might be over, I heard two heavy knocks ring off the hard oak door. Hannah winced at the sound and continued to sob in my shoulder. We remained in the middle of the floor, anxious to see what our sadistic guest might want. Two more heavy knocks rang off the front door, followed by a dreadful silence. 
Come out now, and we don't have to come back tomorrow, a rough, raspy voice greeted us from the other side of the oak door. Petrified, I was unable to respond to the intruder. Hannah buried her face deeper into my already tear-logged shirt. Fine, have it your way, the raspy voice concluded. I shifted my arm around Hannah and began rubbing her back, trying my best to comfort her. Tears ran down my cheeks as I began to remember the family that I might not ever see again. Deafening crashes cascaded through the empty house and all the windows shattered simultaneously. I released my hold on Hannah and clenched tightly to the bat in my palms. So this is it, I thought to myself. No one is ever going to know what happened to us. We were going to fall victim just as Mr. Peterson's family had. But then there was nothing. Not a sound from outside could be heard. It was as if they were the darkness, evaporating with the newly risen sun, and there wasn't a trace of life. I was completely exhausted, physically and mentally. I had fallen into a deep sleep the moment that the sun had reclaimed the sky. Once again, I awoke with Hannah shaking me, although this time it was daylight. What time is it? I asked. 4 p.m.? I rubbed my eyes and sat up, cracking my back in the process. Thick, dark bags were taking shape under Hannah's eyes. Did you sleep? No, we can't be sleeping at the same time. We'll have to take turns. This was a sentence I never thought I'd have to hear in my lifetime. I grew up in a small town in Idaho. My family grew potatoes for a living and we never had much to worry about. I was the anomaly in the family, the one who moved away and lived in a big city. I would have never believed that something like this would ever happen to me. The idea of somebody coming into our house and doing who knows what to us while we slept is a very real and very scary possibility. All right, you get some sleep then. I'll check to see if we have any supplies that we might be able to use tonight. She instantly put her head down, and I could see her chest start to rise and fall in a methodical pattern. She was fast asleep. I got to my feet and felt the blood rush to my head, causing me to feel faint. Color faded and I only saw black and white as my vision swirled. I stood there trying to regain my balance while the color slowly returned and I didn't feel dizzy any longer. I staggered to the oak door and disengaged the lock. A lump formed in my throat as heat spread on my face. I gave the door a pull and it swung open, whining and creaking the entire time. A bright flash from the center of the oak door caught my eyes. One of our visitors had embedded a hunting knife in the dead center of the door. I yanked the knife out and quickly tossed it inside the house. I took a cautious step outside, sealing the door behind me. I could see the grass disturbed around the perimeter of the ranch, as if a herd of cattle had grazed on a field. Deep scratch marks had been etched into the siding of the house. Anxiety took complete hold of me and I dashed back inside. I triple checked that I had employed the lock on my arrival into the house. Pure dread manifested within me as I envisioned the night to come. I was grateful for the gift that they had embedded into my door, but terrified of the implication. I pondered the meaning of it. Did they want us to protect ourselves, or were they just leaving us a message? A hopeful thought popped into my mind. We only needed to make it until the Comcast employees arrived to set up the internet and landline. All we had to do was survive the night and then we'd be free from this nightmare. We only have to survive the night, I thought to myself. I took my place next to my wife on the ground, and I lost myself in thought. I sat there wishing for the sun not to set, but I could see the pink and orange light fill the sky. I looked longingly at my sleeping wife. Her face was so soft and beautiful, like the first day we had got here. I exhaled loudly and my heart began to pick up its pace. I stirred my wife awake and we moved out of the bedroom and into the open area. We sat in the dead center of the room. I began to unscrew the doorknob and flipped it so that the lock was facing us. Once I finished the busy work, I locked the door and sat next to Hannah. 
darkness began to slowly shroud our yard. Soon the trees exchanged their tranquil vibe for a dark omniscient anguish. Still weary after emerging from her stupor, Hannah asked where the knife had come from. It was a gift from our neighbors, I said, and began to laugh at this dark, tortured joke. Hannah joined me, only laughing to keep from crying. We remained huddled in the middle of the room and faced ourselves to the front door. We just need to make it through the night. Then in the morning, the Comcast people should be here and we can leave with them, I said, trying to reassure myself. And that's when the faint sound of chanting could be heard. Dread lurched deep from within me. I could feel the blood pump anxiously through my veins. The chanting grew louder and closer to the ranch with every passing second. Whooping and shouting broke the methodical rhythm as the chant began to morph into chaotic screaming. The obnoxious screaming came to a halt as it reached the perimeter of our house. A dreadful silence settled in the air, only breaking to the sound of two heavy knocks. What do you want? My voice cracked as I yelled at the intruders. My wife clutched my waist tight, her head buried deep in my shoulder once again. There was no response to my question, just an eerie stillness. You, the man said with a raspy voice. My wife hyperventilated as my eyes began to flood and my mouth ran dry. The doorknob rattled as the solicitor once more tried to gain entrance. Bangs and crashes resonated throughout the house. The vibrations could be felt from where we were sitting. There was no doubt in my mind that whomever was outside had found their way past one of our barricaded windows. My wife's once gorgeous eyes widened to an extreme amount, staring intently at the entrance of our bedroom. The door began to shake as someone from the other side attempted to break it off its hinges. I handed the hunting knife to my wife and she clutched it as if her life depended on it and it very well might. I rose my baseball bat in preparation to strike, but then the door ceased to jerk. A metallic clinking sound could be heard from behind us. I swung around and I saw the lock disengage. They were distracting us. I rushed to the door, but my attempt was fruitless. It violently swung open and two men outfitted in dark red robes rushed inside our home. I didn't even think. I swung the bat with all my might and it connected with the first man's head. An appalling snap and cling resonated after the hit. A spray of red liquid splattered across my clothes and face. I watched as the man fell like a load of bricks onto the wooden floor. A dark starchy liquid started to form a puddle around him. Harrowing excitement coursed through my icy blood. I swung my bat at the second intruder as he darted towards me, and another strike found its target. The spray of gore found my face and clothes once more. Before he could even hit the ground, I clutched tightly to my wife's hand and we scrambled towards my Toyota Tacoma. I swung my driver's side door open and threw her inside. I heard the sound of footsteps approaching us as I secured myself in the vehicle. I put my key in the ignition and turned. To my amazement, the truck gurgled to life instantly and I slammed my foot to the ground. The truck jerked forward and began to pick up speed. Contrary to my previous assessment, the flattened tires handled far better than I could have ever imagined. I held the pedal to the floor and set us on track towards town. Right as we neared the entry of the woods, three men dressed in crimson robes leaped from a bush, causing me to swerve to avoid them. This sudden swerve took us off the main path onto a forgotten path that had not been maintained. The flattened tire struggled with the raw environment, and we drove for almost a half mile when we came to a fork in the road. At that moment, more clansmen emerged from the bush, standing side by side on one path in the fork. One of them seemed to be pointing a firearm in our direction. I slumped in my seat in anticipation of bullets tearing through our windshield. I shifted our path to avoid the men and we sped past them, kicking up rocks the entire time. We drove, narrowly dodging trees. The whole time I sat there, I was filled with deep emotions, emotions I had never felt before. It was true thrill, pure, unadulterated thrill, like the first time I had ever been on a roller coaster. I used to relish this feeling, but dread still had its claws deep within me. 
We drove along the mismanaged path until there wasn't a path to follow. My headlights barely lit our line of sight, and we suddenly weren't in the woods. We were in a clearing. A clearing that was identical to the one where our house was built. I slammed on the brakes, and the truck came to a screeching halt. A loud, thunderous chant came from outside the vehicle. Men emerged from the tree line, cloaked in dark red, marching towards us. There had to be like 20 of them, all closing in on us. The men in the road were leading us here, I thought to myself. This is the clearing where the Peterson women were found, I announced. I looked to Hannah, and she was shaking and sobbing uncontrollably. I stiffened in my seat and unlocked the door. I clenched the handle and pushed it open. Hannah screamed at me hysterically and begged me to get in the car, but I allowed myself to slip from the seat and my feet found the earth. I walked to greet the man sauntering towards us. All the men stopped moving except for one cloaked cultist that continued to get closer to me. I presumed this to be their leader, and he continued until he was in talking range. He was a stern looking man. His mouth was ragged and his skin was dark. Thin wrinkles were present surrounding his mouth. Without a doubt in my mind, I knew that this was the hooded man I saw outside my window. A smirk formed on his face and I felt him glare at me. How are you enjoying the new home? He asked in the same raspy voice that was outside our door. Well, it was fine until you guys showed up, I exhaled quickly in the form of a laugh. His smile slowly faded. Whether you allow us or not, we are going to sacrifice your wife. She is needed. He said the last line with great gusto, as if it would convince me. The feelings from before stirred in the pit of my stomach. Before I could respond, cloaked men rushed the truck and hauled Hannah away, kicking and screaming. While I was distracted watching her, men rushed me and forced me to my knees. They held tightly to my arms, preventing me from escaping. They then carried her to the presumed leader. The men dropped her to the ground and they began kicking her violently. She soon was left without any strength to fight back. I squirmed, trying to free myself, but to no avail. The presumed leader conjured a knife from his robes. Wait! I screamed at the man. He returned his attention to me, that hard, emotionless face staring in my direction. That stirring of thrill began to build once again. These emotions had a trigger, and the trigger was violence. Before contemplating the repercussions, I responded in the hope to rediscover this overpowering emotion. Let me do it, I said, as thrills swirled in my stomach with warmth allowing the excited rush to conduit through me. The leader smiled, a genuine smile, as if his children had come home to visit him. He nodded a slow and careful nod, making sure his identity was concealed the whole time. The cultist suppressing me released me and I was free to move about. I slowly pulled myself up to my feet. The leader flipped the knife in his hands, exposing the handle to me. I took the blade from his grasp and took a step back. Tears filled my eyes and poured down my cheeks as I prepared for my next action. I slowly lifted the knife into the air and plunged it deep into Hannah's chest. She screamed and howled as dark crimson blood oozed from the wound. All sadness and despair left my body as thrill manifested within me. I looked to the leader as his hands rose to his hood. He slowly pushed it off, revealing his face. Welcome to the Brotherhood, Jorge Peterson said with a smug grin on his wrinkled face. A man to my left handed me robes and a frenzied passion took hold of me. The feeling of acceptance that once eluded me was now all that I felt. More tears licked from my eyes, tears of happiness and joy. The only thing I could say to my new family was, when do we start? Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. This story was written by Ben B one of our amazing subscribers, and narrated by the incredibly talented Modern Scary Stories. So, I would like to extend a huge thank you to both of these incredible artists for their hard work in this video. 
which, if you enjoyed, you should definitely show your love by hitting that thumbs up button. Modern Scary Stories is just starting out his channel and has a fantastic narrating voice. Why not check out his channel using the link on screen now? But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.